Welcome to the show. We're now live as it is 9 p.m. A little bit of pogues to welcome us in. Dirty old town. Uh, tonight we have an incredibly special guest. Uh, I think one of Australia's, I don't just think, I think Australia's greatest investigative journalist. Um, not just important uh, as a journalist per se, but also as a, a symbol of journalism. Um, fearless, um, prepared to attack big targets. Obviously, uh, Dyson Hayden has been in the news very recently, which we'll speak about. Um, she also uh, went after Mr. Eddie O'Bead, uh, who's since done jail time. She's gone after pretty much anyone you can care to name. Uh, she's done it without fear or favour, so we're, we're very lucky to have her. I'm just about to uh, ask her to join, ladies and gentlemen, Kate McClymont. Just about to. This is my high tech part of the show. Dirty old town. There she is. Hello. Hello, Kate. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Now, obviously, um, uh, there's a lot to talk about with, uh, you know, recent uh, stuff with uh, Dyson Hayden, which I'd like to get to shortly. But I'd also like to talk about um, the fact that you grew up in Orange, in a country town. Yes. On a farm, no less. I did indeed. And in fact, um, every morning before school, we had a whole range of uh, jobs like, um, you know, feeding the chooks and um, feeding all the calves. So and in the holidays, we were always um, employed by my father doing all the, uh, you know, the, the, the baling and the making hay and ploughing. We were very cheap. And, and, and also there's a, there's a certain time, because I used to work on a farm when I'm um, in the school holidays. And I remember oh, yeah. there's, you're very much aware of, um, of time when you're on a farm, as in when the day breaks, you know, you're up, you know, whether it's with the feeding the cows or milking the cows or whatever yeah. it is, you're up at the crack of dawn. Oh, absolutely. But I, I must say, sometimes we used to uh, pray for rain just so that when it rained and it was sunny in Sydney, we were allowed to stop and watch the test cricket. I didn't even like cricket very much, but it was just sort of like, yes, we can have a break <laughs> from whatever we're doing because it's raining. Yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the things about a farm too is that there is, there is no end to the work. There is, I know, I know. And I think that's what people don't understand. Like even going on holidays, there's a really complicated thing where you have to arrange for people to feed, you know, feed the animals, the dogs, to do this, to do that. Mm. And whenever we went on holidays, my father, I don't think, ever actually really enjoyed himself. Apart from when we'd go on beach holidays and he would just be this weird dude, you know, with the really brown forearms and yes. the really white all yeah. over. He always <laughs> looked sort of slightly uncomfortable. And I, you always got the feeling that there was this underlying anxiety about being away from where he should have been. Well, because there's so much work to be done. Yes. Yes, and yeah. it's, it's unrelenting. I mean, I, yeah. I guess there's a certain satisfaction to it. But, you know, we had to work Christmas Day, you know, bo Boxing Day. You, you, yeah, life goes on. There is, there is no rest. And I, I particularly remember, like, um, the two ones that I remember was tussocking, getting rid of tussocks, oh, and fencing. Was, was tussocking, were you down, like, was that down near the Snowy Mountains? Is that where they have tussocks? No, it was near Goulburn. It was sort of near Tarago, which is sort of near Goulburn. Yeah. Lots of, lots of tussocks. So what, <laughs> yeah. Hold on. What do you have to do with tussocking? You basically, they're basically a weed, like a clump of weed that's yes. sort of like, if that's, if that's a tussock, and yes. you just basically have to get that out of the paddock. Oh. They're, they're unrelenting. It's, if you can just imagine <laughs> a garden, but it's like a farm, and tussocks oh. were just these really annoying, shitty little clumps of grass that, you had to rip that sounds like the fun uh, job of having to clear rocks 
clearing rocks, rock yeah, farms. So much yeah. fun. Not so much fun. <laughs> and did you also um, on the farm? Did you also encounter or notice? I guess is the question. Um, what to a city person would seem kind of brutality, where you actually, you know, you go and pick a, a, a sheep or a car or a lamb, and you have to kill it and you eat it, and you see all that stuff. Did you see that, young? Yes, and also seeing things like um, seeing injured animals that just got a bullet. Like yeah. there's, it's. Um, I mean, it sounds terrible, but also, um, you know, like if, if dogs turned out to be vicious or anything like that. Um, you know, they were just taken away and disposed of. And it, it mm. I don't know, it, it, you become sort of a little bit more unsentimental, of, not uns unsentimental about life, but you realise that, um, you know, farming is an occupation where you put things out of their misery, you don't let them suffer, it's not drawn out. And also there's an economic cost. Like sometimes yeah. you just can't afford... Um, you know, the ongoing treatment. Like if, if a cow broke its leg, then that was it. Like if it's yeah. an expensive racehorse in the city, that's one thing. But in the country, that was just not um, a practicality really. But also my father who um, trained as a vet, he... Um, wow, how amazing. Sorry to interrupt. So, he, so a farmer and trained as a vet. Yes, yes. What an incredible kind of... I don't know if dichotomy is the right word, but there's something paradoxical about that. Oh, I know. Anyway, he, um, but he had diabetes and he'd lost the top of his, some of his fingers. Right. So when we had to do, uh, when he had to perform surgery or things like that on our, our animals, he used to make us do it. As in, he'd say, could you sew up the intestine wall? And I was sort of like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> and also... Can you put your hands in the uterus and turn it around <laughs> a little bit? Good on your dad. <laughs> oh, no, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Amazing, um, amazing that he was a vet. I just find that it, there's something so slightly counterintuitive. But because now, he well, must have cared thing, for him. Apart from being a vet, he was, also, um, he was also a member of Mensa. And he used to do calculations. What if you don't table. mind? <laughs> And he used to do tech calculations on the tablecloth. But one of his other uh, strange sort of passions appeared to be blowing things up. Like he just loved any excuse to, uh, if there had to be a stump removed, yeah. you know, he'd pack it with dynamite and then blow it up. And I can remember once, um, I, you know, I was coming towards him and we'd been on the motorbike having to round up some sheep or something. And I saw him waving wildly. And the next, and I'm looking at him, and the next thing I know, oh, <laughs> you know, he'd blown up something and I was almost blown off the motorbike. And I remember another occasion, we were having afternoon tea and there was this enormous explosion and he'd blown up our chicken house and it landed on the roof. <laughs> it, was, it was very funny. What a, I mean, what a facet. I mean, the, the, the mental picture I have of this farm is just growing exponentially. I mean, so Mensa member, wants to be a vet, farmer, blows stuff up. Yes, exactly. Yes. What a perfect and day. Does, and does calculations on, on the tablecloth and then said to my mother, oh, you didn't watch it, did you? You didn't watch it, really? <laughs> <laughs> did you have that thing? Did you have that thing of, um, sorry to bang on about the farm. I just love that. That's farms. right. But um, did you have that thing? Did you have cows? Yes. And did you ever, did you milk the cow? And then did you basically do the thing where you just strain it through a tea towel into a bottle? No. No. No, as in uh, we milked the cows and then we just drank the milk. We didn't ever do any straining or anything like that. It, the, the milk went off to, um, you know, the, the dairy co-op. Oh, but okay. Our personal household milk, um, no, we didn't ever strain it or do anything. To, and we never made butter. We never, you know, right. didn't do any of those. Didn't we didn't have stuff. lots and lots of bottles of cherries is what I do remember. Like right. in the pantry was just full of just bottles of cherries that no one ever seemed to eat really, except my father. Right. Now I'd like to take it, do a big leap because um, I noticed um, that you kind of busked at King's Cross. <laughs> yes. So I'd like to jump straight from the farm. I'd love to know the how you got from, well, well, kind of busking, if you could explain what you did, but also okay. the um, leap from the farm so how did you get to King's okay. Cross so, doing that? Okay, so um, 
my mother was a pharmacist and she worked at the um, local uh, mental hospital. Yeah. And so, look, it was always just expected that, you know, the children would go to university. It was just one of those things that that was just expected. So, so I, was that both, both mum and dad expected that? Yes. Yep. It was just, you know, just one of those things, really. And it was also expected that um, I remember, you know, them saying to me, right, okay, now that you've got the marks, you'll either do medicine or law. And I didn't really want to do either of them. But I ended up being talked into doing arts law just because I got the marks. And anyway, I deferred. I did an honours year in English literature and then I deferred from my last two years of law. But anyway. So, you, so, so, you're, one of those, you. so you're one of those huge successful people who have done an arts degree, apparently. Yeah, correct. I know. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I think I really feel sorry for kids today because, you know, it was free when I did it. But anyway, Reese, unlike your yep. good self, who appears to have some acting talent, I have <laughs> absolutely no talent whatsoever for singing, for dancing, for doing any of those things, but I can talk. So I had a busking booth at King's Cross and it was questions answered 40 cents, arguments 50 cents and verbal abuse a dollar. So, and I used to make about $17 an hour, which was, you know, pretty good, um, you know, back when Very dinosaurs good. were roaming the earth. So, yes, and it was, it was really good fun, actually. And, and so how, how long did you do it for? And, I mean, because the cross was obviously, back in the day, was a much more colourful place. And I say colourful in, in, you know, colourful. Yes. Um, it, uh, so, so you must have seen a lot. You must have observed a lot. And you must well, have look, noticed in, a lot about... Yes. And, and, look, the interesting thing was that in those days... The cross was somewhere where people went to on Friday or Saturday nights and they went there. It was all night. Yeah. So you could go up there any time and it would be, you know, teeming with people. Like you go up there now and it is absolutely dead. Yeah, it but, is. But um, my, my little area was um, used to be where the Commonwealth Bank is and there's a round... I know exactly where you mean. Yes. Yep. So that was my corner there. And sometimes... Right. Um, and it was one of those things that the moment anyone does anything different, you know, people would stop to have a look and then yeah. they'd start, you know, because as I said, it was um, arguments, um, it was arguments 40 cents. No, questions, uh, questions answered 40 cents, arguments 50 cents and verbal abuse a dollar. So people would put in, you know, um, 50 cents to have an argument and then if they started chipping in, I'd say, well, if you want to do that, you have to put your own in. So then they'd start arguing. Oh, and then, nice. You know, you could, oh, you could just honestly, you could rake it, rake it in. And then. Oh, so it was but, a little bit like, a little bit like um, the domain, you know, where yes. you remember when the domain used to be a real thing. Yes, exactly. Yep. But anyway, sometimes the prostitutes used to get, uh, sorry, the sex workers is, is now the um, polite term. Yep. The sex workers used to sometimes get annoyed because, that was regarded like people were very proprietorial about their corners. And because I didn't yeah. go, you know, every night of the week or, you know, you could just go whenever you wanted to. Yeah. Um, sometimes they'd say, look, you know, could you please move on? And I'd say, look, I can't really. And if you want to argue about it, you'll have to put in 50 cents. And they would. <laughs> sort of thing. They put in their 50 cents and you've taken my corner. <laughs> <laughs> How, yeah. how old were you at this stage? Oh, I, I must have been in my, I'd say, mm, early 20s, late teens, early 20s. How, so, how did you think of the idea to do that? Like, I just find it such a... And, and can I even make a suggestion? Because when I, when I thought of this, I thought of um, <clears throat> um, Lucy in the Peanuts cartoons where it goes, the psychiatrist is in five cents. Do you remember those cartoons? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, now oh, I'm getting a new idea now. New <laughs> idea. <laughs> but how did that well, idea come to you? What you would charge these days to do that. Yeah. Anyway, sure. but look, um, look and I, it, it's funny, you know, when you look back on your life and you think the little, you know, the little byways that you take along your journey are often the ones that actually turn out to be meaningful and, and mm. when I went for my cadetship at the Herald um, you know I was telling them about my um, you know my busking and I think that 
they were more interested in the fact that I'd done that than the fact that I'd, um, you know, I'd had a radio program on community radio and I'd worked, you know, I'd done freelance work at the Manly Daily and I'd done this and I'd done that. It's just those sort of quirky little things that I think that they thought, look, if you can do that, you can probably ask nasty people questions. Yeah. Well, so I'm still fascinated by it. And, and forgive me for asking more about it. What was, yeah. what was some of the, um, <clears throat> what was some of the most, what, what, what are some of the questions you were asked that you remember the most? And what were some of the insults yeah. that you well, remember? The, the questions I, I can remember some of the questions where I remember some man coming along with his racing guide and saying what's going to ring a win at Port Kembla race five such and such and I snatched it away I said not that that one and the thing is is that you could give them an answer like people would say um how fast is the speed of light and you could make up anything and they'd say well, that's not <laughs> actually right and then you'd say well if you want to argue about it you have to pay more. So, <laughs> so we, you know, it was win-win. <laughs> so it was kind of, the, it was sort of not dissimilar to the way that Trump's running his presidency. Yes, yes surprisingly that, except I do keep <laughs> using the word, I'm the greatest or the biggest <laughs> or I'm the most successful. Yeah. But the other thing that I really noticed was that young men would pay the dollar and say, abuse my girlfriend. So I would just get stuck into the girlfriend for saying, what a loser boyfriend you have. How could you actually date somebody that would do this to you? I mean, that is like appalling. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, and, and that went okay? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Do, do, were, you ever, were you ever troubled by um, a question? Did anyone ask you, actually ask you, because uh, you, I know that, you know, in your career, you've asked very difficult questions. Did you ever get asked a difficult question? Um, look, I can't remember anything that really unsettled me. But as I said, people would ask you questions and um, you had to be quick on your feet because you cannot know the answer to every person's question. Yeah. But... Um, you know, if you've got a broad general knowledge, you can fudge it. And then, as I said, if they didn't like the answer, you could be like Donald Trump and just argue about it. Yeah. <laughs> so really? Yeah. That was fine. Um, and so on to, on to um, your first... So when you very... First, you mentioned that you worked, um, did some stuff for the Manly Daily and, you know, like when you're very first yeah. starting out, um, what was your... <clears throat> initial idea of what journalism was um, and what did you find out it was? I don't, I really don't think that I had a great idea of what journalism was. And I think it's a lot like a lot of things until you actually start doing it and you don't know what kind of journalism that you want to do or what areas you want to do. So I remember as a cadet, the first assignment the Herald put me on was um, in those days they used to have uh, lift out sections like there was um, like the green guide was the television guide was on That's Friday. Right. There was good living on Tuesday and on, no, maybe good. Uh, no, what, what was the food? Oh, anyway, there was food section. Oh, on Epicure? Epicure? Epicure, something it? like that. And then I think good living was on Thursday and right. it was called cushions and pillows. So my first job as a journalist is I'm on cushions and pillows. <laughs> and I, remember, I, remember well, I just go like <laughs> cushions and pillows by Kate McClymon. I, I just go like I, what the so, expose of. <laughs> I know exactly. So I remember one of the first things I had to do. I mean, how stupid is this? I had to do a review of the 10 best beds in Sydney. Now, like, now there's a. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. We will talk about Dyson Hayden later. Oh, I know. Um, anyway, look, it's sort of like so, you look back and you just think. Uh, and, or anyway, all I remember was getting into dreadful, uh, not trouble, but all these advertisers would bring up saying, we advertise with you. Why is our bed not in the top ten? Of the government? And, they, oh, they, and they, did they speak to you personally or did they go through your editor? The editor. Right. And, and the editor would and said, right. yeah, look, right. you know, but you, then you sort of realise it was sort of like a little bit of an eye opener um, as to how it um, rolls. expectations and how it was. Yeah, so it was. Mm. But I, I felt that that was not my calling. 
Right. So no, but did, so did you? It's funny that you brought that up because so you bristled a bit about that, like in that you noticed the the link between sort of commerce and the paper. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right. And and you look in the years that um, have passed since then, there've been a couple of occasions where a powerful organisation has threatened to withdraw their advertising because of stories that either I've done or my colleagues have done. And yeah. I must say to their credit, the editors have always put the actual news first, well, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. I've never had anyone, you know, any of my bosses come to me and say, are you really sure about that because we're going to lose a major account if you write that story. And in fact, I think we're often shielded from those kind of threats. You only find out about them later. Like, you know, one of the editors will say, oh, you gave me so much grief on that story. You know, the, the, and, the, you... And, and also people calling the board, like demanding, and especially prominent um, business figures. Yeah. That's how they get by in their own lives is by going yeah. straight to the top and yep. I want this, and I want that. And I think that they think that they can just do it to, you know, journalists as well. How many times have you found out about those kind of scenarios um, sort of months later at the pub when you're a bit pissed with the editor or, some, or a board member? Is that oh, the way you normally find out or is it yeah, some other way? Yeah, but often it's not till some years later. I had a call yeah. from um, a board member. Oh, it must have been earlier this year saying, oh, the grief that we had over, and it was a particular story, I won't go into it now, but, um, yeah. uh, and so, you know, they just said to the person, look, thanks very much, but um, we can't interfere in editorial matters. But the people were hoping that they would. Now, well, I'd like to talk about, uh, I'll have to kind of work out how to catch this question in a way, but like, because you've been a very, um, a very fearless journalist um, and you've, you know, taken on some really heavy hitters. Obviously the latest one is a high court judge. Um, there's a thing called, a thing called, I'm making it up, but, you know, but perceived pressure. So how have you managed to have the confidence to go after targets, whether it be an Eddie Obede or a Dyson, a Dyson Hayden or a whoever it might be without the perceived pressure of the board and your bosses because i'd imagine a lot of uh, a lot of other journalists would very much feel the perceived pressure look i think you've got to put those things to the back of your mind and you try to always tell yourself that um you're just dealing with um another person like we're all equal and i can remember once i'm um, having paul keating who was the then prime minister ringing up and he was yelling at me so loudly. And I was yelling right back saying, look, if you could read, and I said, which I sincerely doubt that you have the ability, you would know. <laughs> anyway, so I got a text, you know, sorry, I got a message on the computer from the editor's secretary saying, do we need to call security? And I'm writing on a bit of paper. No, just the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, you just have to... Try to put aside someone's position, their power. Just put that to the back of your mind because it's just not going to help you. It'll just stress you out. Yeah. But that, but that confidence, because one of the things that um, is such a, it's such a difficult thing, like as in I go like, I you know, went to public schools. I grew up public schools, working class background, blah, 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 blah. To have the confidence that you, that, to make that, you know, that we go, oh, I could be an actor or I could be a writer or I could be, I have no fucking idea where that confidence came from because not many, if I look around me, you know, growing up, not many people had that. And it's not ego. It's, it's not that. It's something else. It's like a, I don't know. I just, I just wonder where that, um, where the confidence, where you, where you instinctively say everyone's equal and I will treat them thus and, pursue my story i mean that is a that's yeah. a that's a gift whether i'm not i mean that's a gift i i don't actually think it is a gift seriously um okay i just no i just think and look i do the same to criminals 
um, I treat them exactly the same way. And if I give my word to them, my word to them is as good as my word to anyone else. I right. just think it's it's um, it's just fairness. It's just, you know, you treat people how you yourself would like to be treated. Yeah. Um, oh God, I don't know. I sort of feel, I just don't think it's anything special myself. I could just start praising you too much right now no, and I'd no, probably no, embarrass no, no, you. Okay. No, 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 because no, I know I'm the same. Like, I don't, I totally get it. I get it. Um, but I've just got to say that that's a gift. Like, whether you realise it or not, like, to be able to to do that. I mean, I know that, like, I, I like to think that I'm the same way and that I treat everybody the same and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of recognise that I go, I find it amazing that I can do it, like, in that I'm not afraid of authority, if you know what I mean. While I still respect it, I'm not afraid of it. Which is a yeah. There's a, having there's a, said that, yeah. Having said that, though, um, there is nothing that fills me with more dread than having to make that call. Hello, it's Kate McClime on here, and you can hear the person go, <gasps> <laughs> and then you have to say, "I just want to point. Uh, I, I would just like to ask you the following questions. You know, yep. did you do? And you just think, oh, like I can feel my heart sort of like." I find that stressful. Actually yeah. asking the questions, you can pretend you're as cool, you know, you are as cool as a cucumber, yeah. but it's underneath your sort of, your legs are... <laughs> what are some of the hardest questions you've ever had to ask? Oh, well, I just think, oh, look, okay, take, um, take this week. So having to send questions to Dyson Hayden, you know, former high court judge, and, and when you... When you put questions, you have to put allegations to people and you have to give them time to answer. But having to put allegations, you know, did you put your hands here? Did you touch this person there? Did you, like, that is, like, it's, it's yeah, that, that's difficult. But you've, but you've been pursuing this case for a long time too. Look, about two years, um, I first started... Um, looking at this, and this is in the wake of the um, the, the stories that broke, the Me Too stories that broke, yes. starting off with Harvey Weinstein. And, of yes. course, here in Australia, people started focusing on, um, you know, people to look at. And, look, Dyson Hayden did um, come across um, my desk, and we called quite a lot of people at the time. This is 2018. But we just didn't have enough to meet the threshold. And mm. in the background of that, you've got to think of, um, you know, Jeffrey Rush is suing, mm. you yeah. know, Craig McLaughlin I worked on, um, yeah. he was suing. So you had to be absolutely sure. So what got us over the line, I think, recently or in the last couple of months, um, it was the high that two of the women that I had spoken to went to the high court and said, "This is what happened to us." Um, uh, Chief Justice Susan Kiefel then organised a uh, independent inquiry, which upheld not just uh, their allegations, but the allegations of another four uh, associates. Mm. So, when you have the Chief Justice coming out and saying um, the women are to be believed. Um, we have found, you know, basically upheld their allegations. We, I have personally apologised and we, the High Court and the other justices, are ashamed that this happened in our courtroom. That gives you a fair amount of confidence that you are on the right track. And, yep. look, since the story um, broke on Monday, it's just been absolute chaos you know more people calling yeah um you know making further allegations it's just anyway well i, I, I think Sorry. well I, I i've even even myself i've been contacted by a very notable person who uh where he was teaching at uh, sydney university i think we mentioned before we spoke i won't say who said it but um that, you, you uh, will later <laughs> turn, turn to you later. No, only to you I'll get that out of you <laughs> but uh but that uh he was known as a bit of um an odd bod even back then mm. but it's amazing once the dam breaks once the little crack in the wall comes and then the and the stories come you know yeah it's, it's quite amazing but it's it's interesting i found um 
um, Mr. Hayden's reply by his lawyers was um, like fascinatingly legalistic. Like apart from denying the allegations, he said, um, if I have caused any offence, it was, um, you know, accidental and unintended. And could you, the High Court, pass on my apologies to the associates? And I thought that's... That's a bit of a, That's... you know, a, a half-assed effort, really. Like, you're not really... Well, it sort, of, it sort of sounds... It sounds like a message from um, somebody sitting in a Chesterfield lounge with a cigar, passing a note to a butler, asking if you could yes. pass the note to somebody else in that bar. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. I, 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 yeah. I won't get up myself, Jeeves. But if you could just yeah. pop over and deal with those, yeah. you know, pests. Yeah. But it, it's... The other thing, though, that it's raised, which I find fascinating and depressing, is that it's raised a whole lot of other issues just about the power imbalance in the legal profession. It's yeah, really absolutely. hierarchical. Yep. And, you know, these women had, you know, no one to complain to. But I find, you know, one of the most interesting um, people that I spoke to is a current judge and her allegation was basically one of indecent assault, that she's sitting at a formal professional dinner. This is when she was a barrister. Mm. And he slides his hand between her legs. And as she said to me, that is an indecent assault. It's a criminal yeah. offence. And I said, mm. did you say anything? And she said, no, I, he was a high court judge. I'm a barrister. Um, even then, the, the fear but, but The of, fact I mean, that she's even yeah. a barrister. I yes. mean, a barrister, not like a legal clerk. You know, if, if we're just talking yeah. hierarchical, yes. a barrister yes. says that? Like, that's extraordinary. Yes. And, and the fact that she is a judge now and she still yeah. feels that her career might suffer if she spoke, um, if, she, if she identified herself. Well, it's so that the, thing about, like, but there, there must be, I mean, so many professions have their secret language so like as in latin for example is obviously in the law there's it's a lot of latin and, and legalese you're in the club you're either in the club or you're not in the club i mean in showbiz you have the same thing you have gaffers and best boys and grips and words that other people don't know same with medicine where they go you know lots of latin when it's a club um when the club is so kind of clubby it, it feels that abuse is is can happen be, just yes. by the very nature that it's a club. Well, it's, I think, but also um, people like Dyson Hayden, um, just from a lot of people that we have spoken to, was like a huge legal brain and he knew it. And he was an absolute, um, he was notoriously cruel uh, to other people and about other people. So yeah. there was... Um, so you're you know, speaking but, to character. But, so you're speaking to yeah, character there. Yeah. So yeah. and towards the end of his judicial career, when he was handing down judgments, like normally, um, if there is a majority judgment, somebody will you know write the judgment, and you'll all say yes, I agree, I agree. Towards the end, he'd say, "I'm doing my own judgment because I don't like your split infinitives." So <laughs> this is to his colleagues. Whoa. So he was saying, um, you know, I just find your grammar so right. disturbing. Yeah, yeah. I am going to do my own judgments. And I just think I've, I have found him one of the more fascinating people I've ever, ever encountered in a story. And I tell you, there's so much more to come. Oh, I'm sure there is. And that, that speaks so much to the concept um, I was speaking to Julian Burnside a few episodes ago about the concept be between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And yes. um, yeah, and that, that, that letter of the law thing, like you say, it's split infinitive, you know, like really going into the minutiae of, of, of that stuff where it's like, are you doing a just and a wise judgment? You know, it's a completely <laughs> different question. Can you, imagine, can you imagine how I felt typing out the questions? Looking at my grammar, you know, was there a yes. participle? Was you know, were, Did, were any of my infinitives? Was there an Oxford split? comma? Was, was there know. an Oxford comma? Yeah, I know. So I was 
<laughs> well, I noticed today, I, I, like, I was following your Twitter feed today and somebody posted on there about, um, they said that, um, that he doesn't have a computer, A, and B, has to have his emails read out to him. Yes. Whether I don't know if this is true, but I, I mean, I, I tend remember, to trust um, it, but that's extraordinary. Because during the, um, that came out during the Royal Commission into the trade unions because there was an allegation that, um, that Dyson Hayden as Royal Commissioner had accepted an invitation, I think it was to speak to either a Liberal function or yes, a, that's right. a Conservative related function. Yep. And he had initially said yes and then I think declined. But there was a whole lot of stuff about how he hadn't seen the invitation because it had come it had come via email and it hadn't been read out to him and then it emerged that here is this judge who doesn't use a computer and other and people have said that you know he had all these people you know transcribing things and and running and putting things in the mail to be sent and, off because he and, didn't email and this is the judge who sat on the Google versus the ACCC case. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Just, just saying. Yep. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it um, is pretty wild. <laughs> so um, just to go back to um, not just uh, uh, Dyson Hayden, um, but corruption itself. So obviously with um, the Eddie O'Bead case, which was, you know, which is one of the more, you know, you're renowned for that case and that Eddie O'Bead went down for that stuff. Um, is there a, I'll ask this question. This is a slightly odd question. Is there a difference between Sydney corruption and Melbourne corruption or are they just corruption? Uh, no, there, there is, there is a little bit of difference. Like there, there is, um, some similarities, but I think in Melbourne there's um, their organised crime corruption um, is in more recent years has been a lot more violent than ours and um, a lot more rigid in the not the gangs because they're a bit more sophisticated than that. Gangs are sort of like seem to me to be roaming people out on the street, but I mean the organised yeah. crime structures, yeah. where I think in Sydney our organised crime structures re uh, revolved around property development. Right. Before, no, I, I, it is. It's true. No, like, it's really true, though. Uh, like, I, I'm not laughing because of... It's just true. Like, it, it's... I'm laughing yes, acknowledgement. Where there is, um, you know, where there is a dollar to be made. And I think um, people don't understand um, how terrible it is, the decline of your local suburban paper because mm. the true corruption, a lot of it is in local councils. Mm. And that's where as a property developer, it's not that expensive to, to, you know, bribe councillors or to, you know, bribe um, general managers because you can get another four floors worth a couple of million dollars for a very small outlay. Mm. And with, um, journalists not going to meetings, not having a look at developments, not seeing that a local park that was belonging to the community has been handed over or a bit has been hived off for a developer. That's yep. where so much of the corruption occurs. And there's just not enough of us keeping an eye on all those things. Mm. Is there, do you think there's, is there anything that could structurally be done in your view as uh, certainly with councils, because I mean that the council thing has been going, I mean, it's been going on for yeah. I mean, just for so long. Um, and I'm always, I'm always amazed, even at a federal level, how easy it is to buy off a politician. Like if you're going, here's $10,000 in a bag. I go $10,000. It's $10,000. It's not like a huge amount of money. It's like, or here's a Rolex, you know, like I'm like, we, we just bought so cheaply. It's just sort of staggering oh, to well, me. One of, one of my favourite ones of that was um, that came out during ICAC was when the um, the then Lord Mayor of um, of Newcastle was driving around. I think, and it was either his Bentley or his Rolls Royce, <laughs> lifting up the lifting up the boot and dispensing ten thousand dollars in cash. And at one occasion, the um, the politician was the local vet 
and he was in his scrubs having been operated on an a animal and the Lord Mayor came by. So he you know, pulled off his gloves and out he went, got the money. Anyway, I wrote the story and I was inund inundated by readers saying, what happened to the dog? Oh. <laughs> he was halfway through an operation. They were more concerned about that um, as a result of this person's corruption, the dog might have met with, um, you know, a bad end. An unseemly operation. end. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, what, what... you do have to have a sense of humour about a lot of this because it's just, you know, half the time you just think you cannot make this shit up. Oh, you really no, can't. No, I know. It's so extraordinary because there's so much ineptitude, like as in criminals that I've kind of met or heard about or had any contact with, the ineptitude is what gets me. Like, I just, I'm like, did you really? Like, did you honestly think you were going to get away with that? Like, it's just, I mean, if you just go and sit in court just for a day at a magistrate's court, I remember I was there with, because my sister loves going to court, right? Just loves just hanging out at court, watching the stuff. So she took me along one time and these people were in there because they'd set up an ice lab in a five-star hotel in Melbourne. And I'm thinking, how well, the, the rent's fuck? a little bit high. <laughs> I just, but how did you... How long did you think that lab was going to roll? Like, just beyond me. Like, it's just, I don't know how much ice they took before they did it, but whatever, you know. Yeah, uh, like, whatever. Because there's, I mean, there's something about crime and criminals. I mean, you, you, you know, you've been more certainly the high end, but do you see any greater intellect, <laughs> like, at the high end? Oh, no, no. Um... And I think that that's what's fascinating is, especially when it comes to white collar crime. Yeah. Um, and I'm, this is what I'm talking about: insider trading, yeah. um, you know, getting advantages, knowing the outcomes of things. Like you know, like say betting on, say MasterChef. Yeah. Um, th there's obviously a result that is known to a handful of people, um, and you can. So bet people bet on MasterChef. Yes, but the, the bookmakers, okay. look, anything, um, yeah, I, I think there is a, a market on MasterChef, but I think okay. that the bookmakers restrict the, um, the bets because the, the prospect of it leaking yeah. is just, and we've just seen it recently um, with allegations that um, there was inside knowledge on the, um, this is betting on last year's um, Daily M uh, Coach of the Year award. Okay. where this is the people who were actually handling the the computerised, you know, adding up of the betting, yeah. went to the pub, said, guess what? Craig Bellamy's won. <laughs> so at the pub, all the mates go and put money on and suddenly, yeah. you know, the bookmakers, bookmakers oh. know that, um, you know, the pub <laughs> the, in, you know, in, in, you know, Double Bay, suddenly yeah. all the money. The golden sheaf has just, gone off. Yeah, yeah, the golden head's gone off. Yeah. So you just think, oh, really? But it's yeah. funny because um, I do get, um, I mean, I, I love the fact that even people that I write about in a not very nice way yeah. end up um, being my sources. Like they'll ring up, like people that ring up from the That must happen a bit. I do. They ring up from the golden sheaf. They, like I just had a call from the golden sheaf the other day alerting me to something that was going on. And I just Shenanigans. Think, you know, I remember you were threatening me once and now you're my source. I love that. <laughs> so <laughs> so how much, you know, like, because you must, I mean, you're, let's even just put it in gossip column, right? Stuff that you cannot publish, like that you would never touch. But your knowledge, like as in how much stuff you must hear, if you could like even do this for me, like let's just say <laughs> that's your knowledge compared to how much you can publish, what, how would that be? Oh, it's called, it starts with D and it's called defamation. <laughs> oh, no, I know there's the defamation yes. part, but oh, what no, I'm yes, saying is yes. your knowledge must I be know, yes, yes, so yes. massive and also, compared to you know, what you can say. And I have to confess, I am, um, you know, an incorrigible gossip. But I, I like to just call it an exchange of ideas and information rather than gossip. And I love that. No, but as a, as a person who actually loves gossip, um, do you... Have you, how often have you found the gossip to be wrong? Oh, um. Like on a percentage kind of scale. Look, it's not usually, no. 
in fact, usually it's not totally wrong. Right. But the details might be a bit skewed with, or the story isn't quite as good as it had initially been um, presented to you. Right. Because so, it gets sexed so, up. I mean, like the story, because yeah. people love a good story. So they yes, want to, you know, yes. yeah. Yes. And the, and the, you know, sometimes when you strip away the embellishments, it's not actually that great. Right. But I also get, I cannot tell you how many, um, emails and messages I get to investigate people's story like um, corruption in the flanges in the plumbing industry. Like that's one, you know, I think, yes, I really would be dying to do dying that. To know. Story. Dying to and know. And also it's quite sad because I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of interstate ones with people saying, you know, I mean, I'm sure they say this probably to everyone they contact, but you are my last, um, um, you know, my last chat. chance. Yep. I've been done over, as soon as I hear that they've been done over by, um, you know, the local police, the judge, their lawyer is in collusion with another lawyer, the government, um, you sort of, your eyes... The tinfoil hat starts to... Glaze up. Uh, and anything in indiscriminate capitals, underlying, uh. or if there's ever a psalm quoted, like, <laughs> basically... <laughs> I love it, the psalm quote. Though I walk through the valley, <laughs> you know, know whatever it might be. Uh, okay, they're, they're gone. Yeah, right. So, um, what is the what's the greatest tip you've ever had? Oh, gee, greatest tip I've ever had. Oh, I don't know. Um, like, have you ever had a real and forgive me for using the term deep throat, but a real deep throat moment, like as in like a real a source that is just like. Holy dooly, what a supreme... Look, I've, I've, but I've had those at times. But when you get an anonymous source giving you mm. absolutely amazing information, um, it's sometimes very hard, like, and especially if you can't go back to them to say, where should I look? Um, and, and people are often critical of journalists. Uh, for instance, Nick McKenzie from The Age has had fantastic stories recently about... Um, you know, the shenanigans in the Labour Party in, um, you know, in Melbourne. Yeah, that's right. And people say, oh, you know, why don't you look at, you know, X, Y, Z in the Liberal Party? And you think, yeah. I just don't think you realise, you can't just think, you know, I mean, look, you can try to look at things, but often yeah. you need, you need an insider, you need documents, you need someone to be able to, you know, verify things. Yeah. And you also need like especially if people have got trust companies or offshore accounts, actually getting behind those is incredibly difficult. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the same powers of police. And as much as I'd like to say, excuse me, Mr. Robede, could you please hand over all text messages and all phone numbers? Yeah. It just doesn't happen like that. No, but it's interesting that you bring up the Victorian case because um, personally, as a, I'm a, pretty sort of shameless labor kind yep. of person yep. but i also but i also um very much thought thank you age thank you 60 minutes for bringing down a fuckwit like who's actually tainting the labor party just the same way that you did with eddie obede i think thank you like you cleaned house like i yes. like, like I, I i it kind of surprises me the the kind of um the anger towards journalists when they're cleaning house, like I, I know, I, but it's, it's always, a positive. And, and and the thing is, is that um, it's so easy to accuse you of being um, pro labor, pro liberal, yeah. when uh, corruption is corruption. It's absolutely. You know, it's neither one party is not better than the other party. There's That's always right. wrongdoing, and the thing that worried me about that um, Adam um, Somurek story. This is the the, the Melbourne. MP yep. who was branch stacking, yep. is that that actually affects our democracy. When you have people, like tiny amounts of people controlling um, um, branches, parties, they get to choose who your local member is. That's right. They get to put in their, 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 their friends and their associates to try to, you know, control a certain outlook, a certain outcome, 
and that is just not healthy at all. No, it's it's betraying democracy for mine. Yeah. It's, it's it's literally betraying the trust of the party and yeah. of the the voter toward you know like what is democratic. Like it's actually damaging the polity, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, and if people think that it doesn't happen in the Liberal Party, you know, <laughs> they've got nuts in their heads. I think yeah, at one yeah. stage last year, the um, the young Nats were trying to recruit all these, um, I don't know whether they were neo-Nazis or... Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Something yep. like that. Yeah. I remember that case. Yeah. Yep. Um, so now I'd like to talk about um, journalism per se, because obviously... Um, you've seen a lot of change over your lifetime in that, you know, there, you've been, you know, you've been allowed to work for a long time and we've just seen, you know, obviously since the internet's come in um, and certainly in the modern age, journalism is, it's, it's somewhere else. Like in that there are so many different voices from so many different platforms and the, and the, the mainstream media, which I, I don't even like that term personally, but that the, 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 the behemoths, you know, the papers are getting thinner, you know, like um, it's not broadsheets anymore. All, I mean, so much has changed. Um, I'd love if you could reflect a little on the past and also what, what's happening now and what you see coming. Well, I remember in the past the most important um, tool of a journalist was the phone book. So I can remember how we used to have, like, if you wanted to find somebody, you went through the phone book because there was their name, their address, and then there was all the phone books from every area in Australia. So you would start looking through those and you'd ring, try to find connections between people. And the fact that now, and also if you wanted to do um, a company search, you had to go down to company's house. You couldn't, I couldn't say, I'm going to see what companies Reese Muldoon has. I would have to know the name of your company. And my favourite story on that was um, was a corrupt union official and someone told me that he loved greyhounds. So I went to the greyhound racing board and got all the names of his most successful greyhounds and went down to company's house and asked for any companies in these names. And I remember, bingo, his major company was called Pied City, which was the name of his winning greyhound. But I think now I can sit at my desk and type all those things in, like the, the amount of information that is currently available to you, like overseas publications, um, you know, the fact that you can type someone's name in and if, if they've been up to no good, you know, in New Zealand, you're likely to find it. I just think the information explosion has been absolutely extraordinary but with that has come the the fracturing of the media like you know when i started you got your information from the daily newspaper from radio or from the six or seven o'clock nightly news and that was it yep. and those yep. outlets tended to be fairly straight in their news you know um reporting whereas now uh, you know there's accusations of you know slant and bias and then there's facebook people get their news from um you know so many other ways mm. that i just think trust in the media has absolutely um, plummeted and i can understand why you know in in many respects mm. not of course for the sydney morning herald or the <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course um, so but so um with that I mean, I've spoken about this on this show a little bit, but the, the thing of, it seems to be such a golden age, like a post-fact age, in that, that facts, you know, that opinion seems to be the lord yeah. of everything yeah. and fact is not what it used to be. Well, I think, um, I think the mainstream, oh, I hate that word as well, but I think um, yeah. in the major publications, I think that it is, really important and i think this is done usually is opinion is quite clearly marked as opinion it certainly and used to be well and yeah. news but i i understand what you're saying that often you'll get a flavor of there'll be sort of bitchy comments 
within a news story that should be just a straight up and down news story. And I think there is a little bit of blurring at times. Mm. So um, now what do you think of um, the ABC cuts? I have to ask because it seems to me sort of economically, it's, it's not that much money, you know, considering what we're going through economically. It's like $75 million, whatever, and they're cutting so many jobs. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I, I really, um, I, I, it upsets me because I just think, you know, you just look back at the bushfires and what an absolutely vital service that the ABC provided and how much of their budget they had to eat into in order to provide, uh, you know, around the clock, um, you know, staffing, supporting, you know, getting things out, making sure uh, transmitters were working, like the, the extra engineering and staff in covering all that. And there was not one cent of extra money for doing that public service. And it's not completely as a result of, um, you know, having to expend that money. But uh, look, I just think it's, it's pretty sad, really. And I think, you know, institutions like the quarter to eight news being cut. Okay, mm. a lot of people might think, oh, you know, ho-hum, but like that's just been um, such a staple of a lot of people's lives. Oh, a part of the rhythm of the day, you know. Yes, like just, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, last couple of questions, because um, how do you think the nation's going? Oh, look, all I think of is, um, you know, I think we're going absolutely fine and dandy when I look at, uh, you know, <laughs> look over at the US, which I think is in turmoil. But I, um, you know, I'm, I'm being flippant about that. Yeah. It's, um, it's just so hard to tell. And I just think that what are we going to be in for in the next couple of years? You know, are young people about, you know, are they going to be able to get jobs? You know, the um, university sector, sector is going to face an absolutely terrible time trying to get money for research, um, mm. students, et cetera. So many people are going to lose their businesses. I just think we're facing a time of enormous uncertainty. But um, I don't know. I think we're sort of pretty resilient. Um, I just hope there just aren't huge sectors of society that fall by the wayside. As far as as far as corruption goes, what do you think? I mean, you, because you've studied it for so long, um, what do you think? What do you think are the most sort of um, dangerous areas as far as corruption goes? Do you think at the moment, like as in going forward? Dangerous areas? Do you mean economically, or do you mean impact on society? What did you have I, in mind? I pulled. Probably both, which is probably a, a bit of a cheap way out. But um, you know what, a, a lot so of... ec economically and kind of um, for the and forgive me for saying the soul of the nation, but sort oh, of economically and the soul of the nation, if I, I can say both. I think what you are going to find is enormous corruption in people falsely, um, you know, taking um, job keeper or you know like. People will always find a way to, you know, try to get an advantage or, you know, to, to you know, get a, a wedge in there. And the thing I've heard a lot of lately is that, um, you know, a, a number of em employers have been taking the job keeper, job keeper. but not passing yep. it on to their, um, their staff who should be getting it. So I just hope that there's not going to be a lot of that. And when we have um, big stimulus packages it's like with the the pink bats and it's like with other things there will always be unscrupulous people ready to um, to take an advantage you know ndis um, scams and and also you know the, the things that really upsets me is things like you know bush buyers yeah. you know people you know taking money that should be rightfully going to more deserving people. I just think they're those cha the charity scams are the ones that really upset me. When people think that they have donated to something really worthwhile and, you know, some fat cat's lining his pocket with it rather than passing it on to someone with no home. 
and the insurance yeah. companies. They're the other ones. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Now, would you please do us the honour of um, announcing your song? Because we're just about to run out of time. Oh, okay. So we can just go um, into the song. I, maybe it was the mood I was in today, but one of my favourite songs is Bob Dylan, Idiot Wind. And it's just because it is so wild and angry. <laughs> and it's just so, so, so mm, bitter. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an my absolute pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Bye.